Welcome to our 1030 press conference, The New Science of Fog. Our speakers today are Clive Dorman from San Diego State University, Kenneth Cole from Moss Landing Marine Laboratories, and Peter Weiss Penzias from University of California at Santa Cruz. Oh, let's see now. Uh, Ah, uh, uh, probably beyond help. Um, oh, uh, are they doing something for us? Excuse me. Yeah, oh, this one. This is yours, right, sir? Uh huh. Mm, okay. Um. Well, hello. So. Uh, I was going to say a little something about uh, about uh, fog. Uh, I know you're all really excited about fog, uh, and uh, fog is actually a cloud that's touching the ground. Um, and if it's not touching the ground, then it's not fire. It has to be uh, something else. This is relatively simple over the ocean because you have a flat sea surface. Now it's a little bit different uh, for coastal mountains because the marine stratus will not be fog, but it bumps into the coastal mountains and uh, where it touches the, the mountains, that, that's fog uh, there. Uh, it turns out that the big thing about fog is the visibility. So the visibility has to be less than a half mile. Uh, and of course, there's things that goes along with that, like with uh, the amount of moisture and drop. So there's some physical reasons that you know, fog is, is, is different. And when the visibility goes much greater than that, then it turns into something like mist. So in a way, you could think of mist as kind of a fuzzy cloud, but don't tell a meteorologist uh, that because they'll, uh, they'll, they'll throw up. And of course, uh, you can see here, uh, I got a picture of uh, fog looking down from the top. Fog tends to be low, uh, usually no more than a couple hundred meters, more or less. And of course, over in the, the far left uh, is uh, the mist thing. So it's just a reduction of visibility below 10 miles, but not down to one mile. And of course, uh, the big deal about California is, is that the coastal fog is greatest during the summertime, uh, and it's, uh, the highest concentrations are jammed up against the coast, probably within maybe uh, over the inner shelf. We're talking about maybe the inner 10 kilometers or so, and then it peters out offshore. So on my left slide there, um, uh, where you see the colors, that's where you have uh, uh, fog. The numbers represent the percent of uh, fog during the summer. The highest is sort of um, uh, uh, gets around uh, 10 or 11 percent for part of that that you can see, but it's up, up to about 16 percent. So that, what that means is at uh, uh, about 16 percent of the time for one place, uh, there's fog. So. Out of 100 days, 16 days, there would be uh, fog. The big deal about this, in addition to being jammed up against the coast, mostly along northern uh, California, uh, say San Francisco, up to southern Oregon, uh, that, that the highest fog is associated with a sea surface temperature. So on the right, the sea surface temperature map there. And uh, so the, the blue, as you might guess, uh, is the coldest. Uh, uh, water uh, during the summertime. These are all summertime uh, things. And uh, it's mostly from San Francisco um, up to uh, southern Oregon that sort of matches where the fog is. So it turns out this is true for worldwide. If you're marine fog, uh, you form preferentially where the coldest water is. Uh, so this is one, one uh, e example of that. Um, let me see, okay, uh, then the punchline is here that if you take the area where you see the colors um, and then you look at the uh, average fog over the years, you get the graph on the right. So this runs from 1950 to uh, uh, actually about uh, 2007. And so each dot represents the average fog uh, uh, during that year for this whole area. And the, the, the thing is, is the fog is increasing, uh, you know, somewhat over the 50 years. So it's about, about 7%. This is, uh, and of course what I mean is, uh, 
it's a percent change. So if there was, say, 10%, it's a little confusing, 10% fog at the time, it means over the, the, the uh, almost 60 years that uh, the fog changes nearly by one day, adds another day on. That makes, you know, kind of like 7 or 8%. So that was the, uh, the result. This is just based upon ship obs, and it's just over water. So there are no land stations uh, in this. So that's uh, kind of like uh, what we got with that. The other thing that fog needs, in addition to the coldest water, it needs an air temperature inversion. So um, uh, that's one of the reasons uh, you get it. And uh, so you see these satellite images. And on the lower portion, it's actually the cloud goes into the sea surface. So it really is fog. And the northern portion, uh, that cloud is not touching the sea surface. So it's not fog. Anyway, so that's it. So uh, I should. Um, these, these, uh, these people have some interesting uh, aspects about the effect of, of, of the fog on, um, well, the chemistry, I guess. All right, thanks, Clive. That's uh, really fascinating. So um, I just need to pull up the next escape. Thank you. And click it, which is over here. And then like F5. Okay, yeah, button, yep, lower right -hand corner. there we go. Okay, so my name is Peter Weiss Penzias, and uh, we're gonna um, stay mostly in the atmosphere with this little talk, and then we will go into the ocean trying to probe uh, and discover the source of uh, some of the chemical constituents of fog. Um, so the title here is Mercury in Pacific Marine uh, Fog Water uh, Results from Two Summers of Sampling in Fognet. And we've got a bunch of collaborators, uh, different sites in California that have been collecting fog water and doing chemical analysis uh, and also making uh, fog water volume measurements uh, with the primary goal of uh, determining the mercury concentration in the fog and specifically a form of mercury which is called monomethyl mercury. And so you might wonder why we're just picking out one of the elements out of the whole periodic table. Well, mercury is a very unusual substance. It's a neurotoxin, so there's human health concerns and uh, ecosystem effects. Um, and uh, its cycling in the environment is very complex. So I put together this cartoon to try to illustrate the processes that we are investigating by looking at the mercury content in marine fog. So you can start out uh, looking at mercury sources to the atmosphere, and this thick arrow here is primarily um, smokestacks and mining, coal combustion, and then there's secondary sources like previously deposited mercury. So they're all coming out to the atmosphere. So some fraction is depositing again to the land very quickly, and, but most of it is this inert gas, which is elemental mercury. And it travels and it dilutes, and it slowly gets oxidized by atmospheric radicals, and then they fall back in rain or particles uh, to the ocean and to the land. Now, once it lands into the ocean, and it's this mercury-2 compound, it can undergo methylation by iron and sulfate-reducing bacteria. And so that's how the methyl mercury gets formed, which is the most neurotoxic form. And it enters the base of the food chain um, in the aquatic system, and so from phytoplankton to zooplankton and the small fish and the big fish. And you get a bioaccumulation factor uh, somewhere on the order of 10 to the eighth because the concentration in the seawater is around parts per quadrillion and the concentration in the fish that we eat, especially tuna and other carnivorous fish, is in the parts per million range. So it's a huge enrichment factor. Now some of the methylmercury that doesn't get incorporated in the biota, it is in the form of dimethyl mercury, which is much more, uh, much less water soluble, and so it can part a part of it can escape to the atmosphere, and where it undergoes some sort of processing to form monomethyl mercury, which is much more water soluble, and uh, it absorbs into the marine fog, which is just a bunch of cloud droplets, like what Clive was saying, uh, just water droplets. So it's going to be water soluble substance in the fog, and then the fog then deposits or precipitates onto the land and we have a source of monomethylmercury 
to the terrestrial landscape uh, that otherwise wouldn't uh, be present. And of course, uh, some fracture of this could come down in rain as well, but it, what we found is that the fog is a much more efficient absorber of water-soluble marine emissions than rainwater, which it forms much higher in the atmosphere and has much less connection with the ocean surface. So I'm just going to briefly give you some of the results from the two years of fog net. And um, so that's what I'll be talking about today. And, but as part of this project, we've also looked at the impacts of coastal terrestrial ecosystems. And because we wanted to see if the mercury in the fog water was actually making a difference, if we could see it, see the effects of the mercury accumulating in the coastal biota. And so that was the, the topic of uh, my poster on Monday. Uh, this data is kind of preliminary, so I'm not going to talk about it today. Um, if you want more information on fog and, and the data I'll be showing today, there's a poster today, this afternoon, and then there's a talk this Friday on fog water collections. Okay, so what is FogNet? It was um, fog water collections for chemical analysis and for volume determination at uh, eight coastal sites in California, indicated by these in the dots. The color coding is the average monomethyl mercury concentration that we found at these different sites over two summers. And then we also collected fog water uh, from a ship and um, Kenneth Cole will be discussing more about that. But at each site, we had an active collector, which has a fan and pulls air in. And the droplets are collected on strings, Teflon strings. And there's a small collection bottle uh, where we collect the water, and then we do chemical analysis on it. And then in addition, there is a um, one square meter mesh that uh, the droplets impact on and coalesce, drip down to a tray, and a tipping bucket rain gauge. And that's for volume determination. So for mercury, we take the concentration that we that find of mercury in the fog water, combine it with the volume of vo fog water collected, and we can calculate what's called a flux, or, or a, a mass amount of deposition that's coming from the atmosphere to the land, and compare that with other fluxes to understand how uh, important this uh, mechanism might be. Um, one thing we found is that the concentrations all up and down the coast were uniformly elevated compared to what we'd seen in rain. Rainwater methylmercury is around 0.1, and all the land sites were um, greater than 0.6, and, and some were upwards of 4 nanograms per liter uh, average concentration of monomethylmercury. Now, interestingly, the concentrations out at sea were much lower, and we're still t figuring that out. Um, Okay, so just summarize the main findings here. Uh, fog water, it's a small contributor to the total precipitation in coastal California. Depending on the site, there's a lot of variation, but around 5% uh, is a contribution to the, to the uh, precipitation. But uh, because of this enrichment from the ocean source, uh, the concentration of monomethylmercury is 19 times higher. This was for the land sites, not the ocean sites, but compared to rain. And so the flux that we calculate of monomethylmercury is 2.2 times higher um, than what occurs from rain, making the fog flux the dominant uh, contributor. Um, and looking at the relative concentrations between sites, we reveal that the main source of the monomethylmercury is indeed coming from the ocean. And these findings are consistent with observations of mercury enhancements in biota from the coastal environment, like mercury content of redwood trees, mercury content of spiders, and then some of the preliminary data that we that I present on my poster on Monday. And um, so just a couple things that we're thinking about doing next. Uh, we want to continue to track this accumulation of mercury in the terrestrial food webs. And we would like to target fog water sampling in near shore environments using drones. We were just kind of talking about this. So it's fresh on our minds. Um, so here's my email address, and I just want to announce our FOG blog. So if you have thoughts and ideas about FOG, please, you can register on our site. And um, it's a very diverse community, and it's, uh, FOG is the great um, the people, the things that brings us all together. So thanks for your attention.
Well, thank you, Peter and Clive. What a great setup for this talk. Um, hard to see you guys. How many of you for, are from California? A fair number. All right. So in California, there are critical habitats that receive most of their water from, uh, from fog on an annual basis, at least during the summertime periods. Um, the Maritime Chaparral Complex and the Redwood Forest are both really dependent on fog, and that's another reason why understanding its behavior and understanding its chemical composition is, uh, is extremely important. Um, our group uh, at Moss Landing Marine Labs, in collaboration with, with Peter's group, um, have been funded by the National Science Foundation uh, in a collaborative project looking at um, fog as a vector for methylmercury to, from oceans to the land. And our group has discovered a strong ocean source of dimethylmercury uh, that could be responsible for the, uh, the neurotoxin monomethylmercury that we find in fog. Um, and that deposits onto coastal watersheds, uh, elevating coastal watershed biota by up to a factor of 10 above uh, non-foggy regions. Um, so let me back up a little bit and tell you how we figured this out. Um, our group has identified marine advective fog as a significant vector carrying monomethylmercury from the oceans inland. Uh, and concentrations of monomethylmercury, as Peter mentioned, can be uh, on the order of uh, 20 times higher than that uh, that, you, that is encountered in rain. So, you know, what's up with that? Um, what's up with this? <laughs> um, well, there's definitely a, um, a marine source, and so our group set out um, to see, to find out uh, what that marine source might be. And so uh, this is sort of a Sir Sherlock Holmes kind of story. It's like oceanographers set to see and shake down the usual suspects that might tell us something about this mystery of how methyl mercury is getting into fog and then subsequently onto land. So in four cruises aboard uh, NSF vessels, regional class research vessels, we set out to the California continental margin, sampling uh, shelf stations primarily uh, that were coordinated with uh, the fog net sites. And uh, the fog net sites are in the green triangles. Um, the stations that we occupied are in red. And those stations in yellow were stations where we were able to um, collect fog as well. Um, but we were sampling everything, everything from the water column to the marine snow particles, plankton, sediments, uh, et cetera. Um, we were also targeting mesoscale eddies in the California current. And it's, um, it's this feature that I'd like to focus on. Uh, for the next part of the talk. Okay. Off the coast of California, um, the California current uh, spins off eddies, some of which spin clockwise um, and some of which spin counterclockwise. The counterclockwise spinning gyres um, or eddies are shown here in blue, and there are regions of, of local upwelling. Uh, so uh, Coriolis Forest will move water away from a counterclockwise spinning gyre, and deep water comes up to, uh, to replace it, as can be shown in this diagram here. So the blue regions are upwelling regions, and they're characterized by a dip in sea surface, um, whereas the um, clockwise spinning gyres, or the anticyclonic gyres, um, result in downwelling or a piling up of water, um, and there is a positive elevation associated with these. So these features are identifiable through satellite altimetry. Um, and, uh, and so for these cruises, we have a colleague ashore who's downloading satellite data and then emailing us out these, these images so that we could direct the ship to either um, uh, upwelling regions or downwelling regions. And what we found are the, is the following. These are profiles of dimethylmercury, the gaseous form of, of mercury. Um, and you can see that in upwelling regions, um, the, the upwelling profiles are indicated here in blue, and the downwelling profiles are indicated here in red and yellow. And um, the, 
the effect of these upwelling gyres tends to shoal the profiles, move them up in the water column, and one can use the gradient, uh, the change in, in concentration as a function of depth, um, from these profiles of dimethylmercury to calculate a flux of this gas from the sea into the, uh, into the lower atmosphere. And, and from, uh, from this modeling of this data, which integrates all types of water column processes, including bubble breaking and gas evasion, we can calculate a flux um, that's equal to about 10 or 11 picomoles per square meter per day. Now, that's a large flux. This is larger than has been calculated based on other gas exchange uh, measurements. Um, and it is about 10 times what, uh, um, what Peter just reported uh, for the fog flux uh, to terrestrial watersheds. So um, dimethylmercury is not monomethylmercury, and so um, uh, we conducted a few experiments um, to see if, in fact, dimethylmercury could be photodegraded to monomethylmercury, and these are the results. The results are no. Um, dimethylmercury seems to be fairly stable with respect to photolysis um, at natural pH. However, if one is to acidify the seawater to pH 5.2 in this case, you can see that there are uh, significant rates of conversion of dimethylmercury into monomethylmercury, um, both in dark bottles and in light bottles. So although dimethyl may not be uh, demethylated by sunlight, it seemed to be demethylated by acid. And, um, and this is important because fog, typically marine fog, um, or the nucleation sites for fog formation, which are marine aerosols, tend to be quite acidic. So the new model um, that we are investigating now is that dimethylmercury evades from the sea surface, uh, particularly in regions of these cyclonic eddies, um, is, uh, is acidified in in clouds and is uh, protolytically demethylated to form methylmercury, stabilized by chlorocomplexation. This fog wafts ashore um, and uh, the methylmercury um, is deposited on land via wet or dry deposition. So that's our, uh, that's our working model, and we're sticking to it until we can disprove that, but it's a, it's a, it's a working model that, uh, that uh, has a lot of promise. So I think we're ready for questions. Okay, are there any questions from reporters? Uh, Rick Lovett, uh, Freelance. So um, this is um, about the chemistry here. Uh, what happens to that, since, since uh, if I understand right, the um, dimethyl is not terribly soluble, um, how does it get into the fog droplets and what happens to that of it which doesn't? Uh, well, that's, a, that's one of those areas that we like to investigate. That's a good question. Um, Dimethylmercury is, uh, is a gas, monomethylmercury is not. So um, even if there's a slight bit of conversion of the dimethyl to monomethyl, the monomethyl will stay with the fog droplets. Um, and it appears to be fairly um, particle reactive too, so as the fog dissipates, it's likely to fall out as a, an aerosol uh, particle. And, and some of, uh, if I may, um, some of um, Peter's research has suggested that when you filter fog, um, the, uh, a large fraction of the methylmercury in the fog is in the greater than 0.45 micron fraction. So it exists even in fog as a, a particulate phase. Are there other questions from reporters in the room? Uh, hi, it's Jonathan Amos from BBC. I wonder if you could just eulogize for a minute about fog. I mean, it's cool stuff, and huge volumes of water are involved. Um, and you, you guys live and, live and literally breathe this stuff, and 
So um, you know, imagine you're standing there in the cocktail party and you uh, were trying to um, enthuse people about fog. What would you say? Oh, well, um, I guess uh, uh, kind of the interesting things about fog, uh, if you're uh, into uh, death and destruction, of course, it's, uh, there's all those things about the marine traffic and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of shipping has to stop uh, if there is uh, if there is fog, they can't usually go into some some ports, um, uh, which really irritates the uh, uh, you know the cruise the cruise people when they can't make their goals. But uh, so that, I mean that there, there's that sort of thing. But and there's, it's an interesting thing from uh, the uh, the plants along the coast and actually uh, the the life in the water because it's making a, a, a kind of a difference to the amount of sunlight that gets to the surface, and uh, it's, it's part of that sort of uh, a matrix. And so what happens is this is probably just one of the uh, ways that, that uh, climate change is, is expressing itself, uh, you know. And uh, so it, it's interesting in that sense. And I also think it makes for great photography, but that's just a personal thing. Uh, sure. Yeah, I just uh, add to it. Yeah, the, the the biome along the coast is so sensitive to fog, and fog itself is so sensitive to a number of different uh, meteorological factors um, that uh, it can dissipate and it can reform. It it is it's very uh, fluid. It's it's uh, almost like mercury itself. You know, the quicksilver is a uh, nickname for mercury and so now you see it now you don't uh, with fog um, but if it were to disappear altogether um, our landscape would would look very very different because you know we are in basically a mid-latitude desert here but you know along the coast uh, we have some of the uh, we have you know the tallest trees in the world I mean so it's real it's very uh, unusual and um, and now we see that the chemistry also is uh, something to take note of. So it, it, it applies not just to the coastal fog, but to other regions that where fog is formed, like in um, valleys and um, uh, other places where it could be a vector for uh, toxins. Um, um, I, I like that question. Um, <laughs> uh, it, as an oceanographer, we spent a fair amount of time trying to chase fog. Um, and capture it, sample it, and uh, we've come to realize that fog is fickle, yeah. and uh, it is uh, sometimes wet enough to sample, sometimes not. Sometimes the satellites tell you you're right in it, and there it is, 50 feet above you, where you can't get to it. Um, I I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and spent a lot of time just watching s fog spill over the mountains, uh, the Skyline Boulevard, and and dissipate into nothing. And I was always always wonder where. Where does all that go? And I think what we're finding now and what's kind of satisfying is it's, it's still there. All those particles are deposited right, uh, right in the coastal zone, right in the maritime chaparral complex, and right where um, the biota can, can get to all of them. So it's, it's become a, a much more significant part of my landscape. Um, Boston Hunt, freelance. Um, if I understand correctly, um, an acid environment uh, converts um, mercury to the more nasty form. Uh, what will the uh, gradual acidification of the oceans do to this? Right. Um, well, let's, let's be, be clear about that. Um, uh, dimethylmercury is extremely neurotoxic as well. Um, so what's proposed here is a mechanism that converts the gaseous phase into um, a phase that can fall out um, with the other constituents of, uh, of fog. Um, when you take a look at the pH um, uh, over which dimethyl is stable, that's on the order of seven to eight, so it's going to be a thousand years before the oceans get down to pH seven and still dimethyl will be stable. It's not until uh, we reach pHs you know, of uh, six or below that we seem to see significant rates of uh, demethylation to monomethylation. So I'm, I'm thinking that there are few regions in the oceans that have those kinds of pHs other than in microenvironments. Um, 
uh, or possibly in, in clouds or on cloud aerosol hydrous coatings. Right then. Uh, Allison Hawks, uh, freelance with KQED. Um, just wanted to ask, I, 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 my understanding is that the verdict is still kind of not really out on um, whether we're going to be seeing more fog or less fog. And I'm just kind of curious, particularly Clive, if you could just um, say a little bit more about your research and how you came up with the increased level of fog. Sure. Um, uh, the, uh, what I did was, was I took, took the ship data and so there's, there's you know, thousands of ships uh, for every uh, one degree uh, square of latitude and longitude, and then use those to derive the amount of uh, uh, fog, the percent of fog that versus no, no fog. So that's how we arrived at. It's based upon the ship observations along the coast as they're, they're uh, spread out. And um, in terms of uh, 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 what has happened, then I simply just divided the data set into individual years, and it turns out that uh, um, although it bounced around a little bit, uh, there was a, f a fairly uh, consistent trend that passes the basic test for uh, significance, you know, um, over those years. And it turns out that uh, that this fog, uh, which is a coastal fog, uh, also increasing are the other two major fog areas in the world. So on the uh, the greatest amount of fog in an area, marine area, is in the northwestern oceans, in the northwestern Pacific and the northwestern Atlantic. So that'll be around the Kurilau Islands and also the Grand Banks. And so for there, uh, the, the fog can reach around 50%. So that means that every other day during the summertime, um, it's, they have fog. And for those areas, both of them, the fog has increased by about a little more than 12% over the same period of time. So I have three different uh, data sets, well, three different areas, and for uh, over the roughly 60 years, the fog has increased in, in those three. Uh, so it was uh, systematic uh, uh, for that. Now, uh, there, so that, that seems to be fairly straightforward. Uh, so there were three different kind of areas that you have fog, the open ocean over the uh, Grand Banks or the Kuril Islands, and then these, this coastal fog where we had enough ships to make, uh, to divide down into the individual years. So all those uh, appear to be in increasing in over the uh, roughly six decades. Now there was another uh, interesting study uh, that was done uh, looking at um, what essentially was is the uh, stratus cloud base um, based upon uh, the um, the cloud based height. So it turns out those were uh, two airports um, along California. One was at Monterey and the other one was uh, uh, at Eureka. And the thing is is that the stratus cloud now um, kind of goes up and down and it goes up and down at, at both those places at about this more or less the same rate that they're related that's because they're controlled by the North Pacific anticyclone uh, and it turns out that that those over the same rough 50 years from roughly about 1950 to about 2000 I don't know maybe 10 uh, over that time that that particular uh, cloud, which would tend to be in the low cloud end, but it's a cloud, not fog. Uh, that didn't uh, did not significantly change over that time, so that was reported uh, with this uh, same uh, uh, paper that you were talking about. And in that case, it was very interesting because they were looking at the uh, the redwoods, and so the redwoods along the California coast are dependent upon this essentially an elevated fog, which is a stratus stratus cloud. And for that, it kind of, uh, over this period of time, it hasn't significantly changed. And that sort of matches the, the same time that my, my data was. So let's see, what did I just say? They said that the stratus cloud appears to, its level is not changing in, in height, uh, but the, the fog seems to be actually increasing, um, you know, uh, uh, somewhat. So there's, there's two different variables there. So I, I think I think 
the, the two of us were talking about slightly different things. Uh, the thing you were, you were referring to was actually about the height of the coastal stratus. And then mine is actually looking at the, uh, the sea level fog along the, uh, along the coast. So I think they're two different kind of uh, variables. Okay, Zoe, I think we have a question from the chat. Yes, thanks. I have a question from Jillian Kemsley of Chemical Engineering News. Can you clarify the difference between wet and dry deposition, in particular the deposition of methylmercury? Okay, you can help me. Um, so wet deposition is going to be rainfall or snow or dew or fog water. And so it's associated with a droplet. And dry deposition is associated with reactive gases um, that simply stick to things or particles that settle or also can stick or impact and um, the chemistry of the thing that is coming out of the atmosphere will determine you know, which the proportion that's going to be either wet or dry. Uh, the amount of, of rainfall or precipitation will also play a role. And maybe wind speed or atmospheric dynamics will also play a role in, in deposition velocities. So primarily, we expect monomethylmercury to be wet deposited because it's relatively soluble. Um, but there's probably a smaller fraction that is dry deposited, although there haven't been any direct measurements of that. Thank you. I think we have another question in the back. Oh, hello, Guy Evans, freelance. Um, I was just wondering, is the mercury concentration highest um, in the in the coastal oceanic region, or is it is it pretty much the same everywhere? So, I mean, where the fog forms in the first place is that because there is particularly high um, is 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 there so much mercury in the fog because there is a lot more methyl mercury in the coastal region or not? Um, that's a great question, and um, what what we're finding out is that the and this is preliminary, but the, the methylmercury concentrations in the fog that's been collected uh, furthest offshore has some of the lowest concentrations of methylmercury, whereas the um, methylmercury concentrations in fog water uh, that are further inland have higher concentrations, as, uh, and that's somewhat consistent with this scavenging model if you, um, if you believe that fog is sort of converting the flux of uh, dimethylmercury into methylmercury, it's accumulating as it's approaching shore. Um, but that's something that we'd really like to um, uh, confirm with, uh, with some uh, additional experiments. Peter, do you want to comment? Well, the only thing I would add is that uh, along the coast, uh, we have the upwelling because of the winds along the, the eastern Pacific. And so the upwelling brings deeper water to the surface, and that contains a higher proportion of organic mercury because it's bringing water that, was, that has, is limited in oxygen, where the bacteria thrive that do the conversion. Uh, so in the open ocean, you probably have lower mercury concentration at the surface, and along the coast, you would have higher. Um, so the, the incorporation of mercury into fog is definitely a function of the upwelling and what's happening in the water. Right. I, I would agree. I would say also that whereas we studied uh, upwelling and downwelling eddies, um, those are sort of separate from the general Ekman wind-driven upwelling that we are uh, familiar with. And so in the general upwelling regions, we will also have large fluxes of dimethyl. And so you would expect to have a stronger source near the shore uh, than you would in the open ocean regions. I was, I was wondering, how long does, does the, uh, a particular molecule stay uh, in the air uh, before it gets uh, dunked or ends up and <laughs> comes back. It has a pretty short lifetime. Uh, anything that's going to be in a cloud droplet is going to deposit within a day. Um, and then if it, if it re-evaporates and it's back in the gas phase, it's probably going to dry deposit within a day. Um, mm -hmm. the, the only form of mercury that is very long-lived is the elemental form. 
And there is a certain conversion rate back to elemental, um, and that can be in the atmosphere for a year. Oh, well, but, yeah, most, most fogs don't last very long. No. Like, like a few days would yeah. be pushing it. Yep. A couple days might yeah. be more typical. Yeah. Hmm. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Hi, Mary Beth Griggs, Popular Science. Um, I had a question. You mentioned early in the talk, you know, bioaccumulation being an issue, um, one of the big issues with mercury. Uh, and I know that you're going to be studying a lot about the terrestrial food web. But um, people are humans that are walking around in the fog. Uh, is there any health risks to people? Um, well, um, I would definitely not eat any spiders from foggy areas. <laughs> and I'd say knock off those right now and, uh, and limit yourself to spiders from non-foggy areas. There seems to be a, a, a big difference. But in terms of the concentrations of uh, methylmercury in, um, in fog water as a public health issue, I think they're, I think they're pretty low. Um, so, uh, so walking around in fog and breathing fog, um, as long as you can see where you're going, doesn't seem to be a health risk. Yeah, the, as far as uh, population-wide health risk uh, for mercury, um, it, it's been estimated and modeled that if we just switched the main fish that we eat from tuna to something else like salmon, that we would decrease the risk, as at least in the U.S. population, by like 80%. So that process is independent of fog. Um, but we, I think the health, you know, on the broader scale, human health is certainly dependent on the health of the environment. And um, so the Minamata Convention signed last year and currently signed by 128 countries, one of the, the foci of, of that uh, for as far as scientists is to better understand the pathways where mercury gets from the source and then primarily through the atmosphere and then into the biota and there's as, as you know just a, as recent as a few years ago we've discovered essentially this new pathway and so that you know how it fits into the larger picture of human health risk for mercury pollution is um, you know we're not sure yet but it, yeah, like Kenneth was saying, it's probably pretty minor uh, as far as a direct effect. But I think your, effect. Point, your point is good, Peter. This is not uh, strictly a human health issue uh, with respect to drinking fog water, for instance. What we found is a tre tremendous amplification of those concentrations in the, uh, in the trophically, in the, in the food webs of terrestrial systems. And so my, my joke about spiders was that actually spiders from foggy areas exceed FDA limits for human consumption. They're above 0.3 parts per million. And so that already is uh, maybe not a health concern for humans, but everything eats spiders. Birds eat spiders, rodents eat spiders, lizards eat spiders. You know, they're, they're just a, perhaps a sentinel species. And, and uh, as, uh, as we understand more about this pathway, we understand more about the way that terrestrial trophic systems amplify contaminants, especially lipophilic contaminants like methylmercury. Is, is that is it? What, why spiders? Is that because the the webs and and drops getting caught? No, probably them? not. No, it's all about diet. And so um, this was work that we published last year, and um, just uh, we just went out and collected spiders right along the coast. And these are carnivorous wolf spiders. They live on the ground, and so oh. they eat other bugs and uh, and detritus. And so oh. they and so because they're carnivorous. And they probably eat other carnivorous insects. There's, they're at a high trophic level. Oh, I see. And so you get the the accumulation, the bioaccumulation. Yeah, people like to think that you know, the, if you can absorb the fog water droplets, that you must be getting a lot of mercury. But hmm. you have to remember this enrichment factor. The concentration in the fog is, like I said, parts per quadrillion. Hmm. And and what we see, we're seeing in the spiders was as high as 0.8 parts per million. So it's quite a quite an enrichment, but there's many food web levels oh. between fog water and a carnivorous spider. I think we have another question. Yeah, my question was almost the same thing. Rick Lovett again. Um, so I'll. But uh, can you talk about anything other than spiders? You mentioned redwoods and uh, other. I mean, what else has this been measured in along the food web? 
Uh, well, there was uh, information, there was some redwood needles that were collected from the, uh, right along the coast. This was work that the U.S. Geological Survey did la uh, and presented at a conference uh, last year. And um, so there was a gradient from, from coast to inland, and the inland redwoods were planted trees in you know, suburban areas. It was the same species, and there was a factor of five higher mercury concentration in the redwoods that were within 10 kilometers of the coast, and then falling off gradually as, as you went inland. Um, so we, we don't, there's not a lot of data on it right now. Um, there really has been very little published, but although there's, there have been some measurements from other regions of the world, and just in fact coming to this conference, people have been pointing that information out to me, because I'm an atmospheric scientist and not a terrestrial uh, biologist, so I'm not necessarily familiar with the literature. Um, our, our Marine Pollution Studies Laboratory has done extensive measurements on mercury in fish, for instance, from the, Cal, uh, from the Bay Delta complex. San Francisco, San Joaquin, San Francisco Bay estuary. And uh, those fish are incredibly elevated, but not necessarily because of fog. I mean, we're talking about legacy gold and mercury mining that's uh, leading to the contamination of those watersheds. So um, yeah, so in terms of biota and, and fog uh, correlations, I think a lot more work needs to be done. And um, that concludes our press conference. Thank you very much. Our next, uh, our next press conference will be at 11.30, Field to Faucet, Agriculture and Algal Blooms. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Clive.